in the midst of your temple. Your praise, like your name, O God, reaches to the world's end. Your right hand is full of justice. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you by the thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. O oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth from generation to generation.
The prophet Malachi offers us both good and bad news. The Lord is indeed coming and will be with us. The Lord expects righteousness from his people, a righteousness that burns away all unrighteousness. A reading from the third chapter of the book of the prophet Malachi, beginning at the first verse. Thus says the Lord, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire, and like the fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner, purify the silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, until they are the present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, and as in former years. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, God's intention was for all creation to live in eternity. Sin and death walked onto the stage and needed to be reminded, remanded. Jesus' death and resurrection restored humanity's at oneness with God, and the fear of death was sent off stage. A reading from the second chapter to the letter to the Hebrews, beginning at the 14th verse. Since God's children share flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those in all their lives who, held, who were held 
in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he has become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement and for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning at the 22nd verse. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, the parents of Jesus brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, 
and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit may so rest upon us that we might not rest until we see your salvation in our lives, in the lives of those we love, and in of all the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, if this day were February 2nd, last Tuesday, we would be standing on the very center point between Christmas 40 days before and 40 days hence the spring equinox. The presentation of a firstborn male was prescribed in the law of Moses, and following that law, Mary and Joseph brought the child Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee down to the temple in Jerusalem to present him as was the custom. Mary and Joseph were faithful in fulfilling the law, took the law seriously, saw themselves in that context of law and obeyed what was set out for them, no matter the difficulty or inconvenience. And it was also the call upon the life of one Simeon and one Anna to be there at that moment that Jesus arrived in the temple. Not serendipity, not dumb luck, not just happenstance. But Simeon, all his life, knew that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. He was promised not by wishful thinking or just hope in his heart, but by the revelation of the reality of that event by God himself. And he did his service in the temple each and every day, faithfully fulfilling his duties, but all the while, keeping an eye, keeping his heart open to the arrival of the Messiah. And for some years he may have had a certain notion of what that Messiah would look like. Probably an adult. Might not have been at first that he was expecting a child. But this child, this Jesus in whom God dwelled fully, Simeon recognized as the Messiah. Out of all the trappings and activities of the temple, all the rituals, all the animals, the sacrifice, the smoke, the money changing in the front courts, Simeon was drawn to that baby Jesus, to those lovely parents took that child in his arms and said, thank God this is the day that God promised to me. And it is the day on which my eyes have seen. And so much of that phrase, my eyes have seen, is metaphorical in the sense of my whole being has been overwhelmed by the incarnation of God. Simeon recognize the fulfillment of the one deepest call upon his life. And all the while sort of parallel to that activity of Simeon's desire was the prophetess, Anna. Married perhaps at 16, 17, 18, widowed at 25, nearly another 60 years, 60 years of fasting, praying, focusing, longing for the redemption of Israel, it's termed, for the Messiah's arrival and presentation in the temple. And she, too, recognized that baby Jesus, perhaps some by the fuss that Simeon made, but certainly by the fulfillment 
of her heart's desire to welcome the Messiah, to bless the Messiah, to be at one with the Messiah. These two persons, Simeon and Anna, as well as Mary and Joseph, were single-minded people. They had one purpose in their life. And albeit a dangerous thing to read current uh, novels or New York Times bestsellers, but sort of parallel in my own kind of weird way to this coming, this day, this presentation in the temple, I've been reading James McBride's book called The Good Lord Bird. It is a book, albeit mixed with some of the author's invention and imagination and storytelling about the last few years of John Brown's life. John Brown, the old John Brown, the Asawatomi of Kansas, who fought with a single-mindedness against the institution of slavery. Obviously, his uh, methodology was not the way of meekness, mildness, and peace. As he stood with his captives and his few members of his committed army in the armory of Harper's Ferry, in hopes that he would be able to distribute the weapons there to free the enslaved, he was encountered by a then federal army officer, a young army officer by the name of Jeb Stewart, who carrying a flag, a white flag of truce, came to the door of the armory to knock and have a discussion with John Brown about what his demands might be. And John Brown slid open the little sliding slot in that door and spoke to Jeb Stewart and said, my only demand is that you free the Negro people from their slavery. Jeb Stewart simply said, not my power to do that. Do you have any other demands? And John Brown said, closing the window, our discussion is over. One demand, one single purpose for John Brown, not perhaps the wisest course of action to accomplish that purpose. But a single-mindedness about John Brown was also very personally revealed in his last day, his last few hours before his hanging in December of 1859. The narrator has been a, made a character to tell the story of John Brown throughout the novel, and that character has an odd little cute name called Onion, based on something that would be a rabbit trail to explain. But Onion goes to visit John Brown in his cell in Charlestown, next door to Harper's Ferry. And the jailer has left the cell door unlocked, and Onion, who all the while, even carrying on with John Brown and being a help and all of that, being devoted to him and being impressed by that single-mindedness, looks at John Brown and says, the, the door's open, you could have escaped at any time. Onion was one that was focused on escaping slavery to save himself. And John Brown says to Onion, there is an eternity before this moment. And there's an eternity after this moment. And I have been made for eternity. And Onion, in his own simple way, understood that sort of eternal cosmology that John Brown was referring to. And he appreciated that single-minded devotion to what John Brown viewed as a call from God. John Brown listened to Onion as Onion recounted his time in that attack on Harper's Ferry, standing in the armor with John Brown, and that Onion had finally and 
encountered God in his fear of his own mortality and of the failure of the whole venture of John Brown. Onion knew that God loved him and knew that God cared for him. And Onion begged in the armory in the midst of all that chaos for God to keep him safe. And Onion recounted that experience from the armory to John Brown in his cell in, Harper's, in Charleston. And it was the first time that Onion ever saw John Brown really smile. Really smile, a smile of delight. John Brown said to Onion, if all of this, all of my moment between the two eternities is to know that you have been set free for the eternity of God, that John Brown knew Onion was with him in that eternal life promised to all Christians. John Brown could rest in gratitude and thanksgiving. Each of us in our single-mindedness, like Simeon and like Anna, like Mary and Joseph, like perhaps even Jesus himself, can make the difference in our lives and our outlooks and our relationships by saying our single purpose is to be present to the love of God and allow that love to flow through us to others, that others may come to know that they are loved by God, and that all of us together are free in the eternal life and love of God. We'll stand together and declare our faith in God by saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank uh...
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your evil sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and the truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Let us save and help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Almighty and ever-living God, we humbly pray that as your only begotten Son was this day presented in the temple, so we may be presented to you with pure and clean hearts by Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Grant, Lord God, to all who have been baptized into the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, that as we have put away the old life of sin, so we may be renewed in the spirit of our minds and live in righteousness and true holiness through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The prayers of the people are form number six. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our for families, families friends, friends, and neighbors, and for, for those, those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the church. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Susan, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God's church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Please lift up your following in your prayers. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, pray for the Anglican Church of Brunei. For those in our parish who are sick or recovering, 
especially Don and Nancy, Pam, Pat, Bob and Lou, our friends, neighbors, and extended family who are ill or have special needs, particularly Sylvia, Carly, Jenny, Justin, Connie, John, Michelle, Joan, Mike, Judy, Anne, Keith, Bill, Darlene, George, Bob, Ed, Betty, Jackie, Barbara, Barbara, Linda, Bo, Chris, George, and Nancy, and Valerie. For those who have died, especially Warren Thorburn, grandfather of Ben Thorburn. For those with special needs, particularly the homeless, the hungry, and all victims of terrorism and their families. For those serving in and supporting the armed forces, especially Caitlin, Robert, Timothy, Matt, Shane, and Nicholas. Hear us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. Prayed. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and, and praise, praise your name, name forever and ever. ever. We pray for all those who have died. May they have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them and put, put their, their trust, trust in you. you. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you, and you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We have been uh, meeting on Wednesday nights via Zoom to do some Bible study on the various themes of the season of Epiphany, and would continue to do those Bible studies for the next two Wednesdays, if not for a pre-council meeting that will be held here, in a sense, those who are willing to come could come, but uh, it will be Zoomed from St. Paul's next Wednesday at 7 p.m. That's a pre-council meeting. Um, the following Wednesday, um, let's see, is Ash Wednesday. There we go. Uh, February 17, uh, the Ladies' Home has invited uh, some participation by St. Paul's at the Ladies' Home, but I think that's going to be of a Zoom nature. So we'll try to give you some more heads up about how you might um, follow that Zoom event at the Ladies' Home, and that would be at 2.30 on Wednesday the 17th. 
followed uh, by a seven o'clock live stream of Ash Wednesday liturgy from here in the sanctuary. In addition to those two um, Zoom live stream events, we are doing some actual uh, ashes to go. We'll gather in the narthex and folks can drive up in their vehicles, honk three times for the Trinity. We'll know that you're coming for the purpose of receiving ashes on your forehead between 12 noon and 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. on Wednesday the 17th. That's to receive ashes um, in your car on Union Street. Um, in the Wednesday nights of Lent, we will begin to read together Richard Rohr's book, The Universal Christ, which is the first time that Rohr, uh, who writes about many theological subjects, writes specifically about Jesus and his understanding of Jesus. And it's just a, um, it's an easy read. He's a wildly well-educated uh, Franciscan um, brother, but um, writes very compellingly and simply. So you can purchase the book or if there are specific um, passages that we would be focusing on, we can Xerox them and get them up on the screen or emailed to you so that you could participate fully in Wednesday nights during Lent at 7 p.m. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loves us, an offering and sacrifice to God. God, you have made this day holy by the presentation of your Son in the temple and by the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mercifully grant that we, who delight in our humble readiness to be the birth giver of the only begotten, may rejoice forever in our adoption as his sisters and brothers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who set us the solitary in families, we commend to thy continual care the homes in which thy people dwell. Put far from them, we beseech thee, every root of bitterness, the desire of vain glory, and the pride of life. 
Fill them with faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness. Knit together in constant affection those who in holy wedlock have been made one flesh. Turn the hearts of the parents to the children, and the hearts of the children to the parents. And so enkindle fervent charity among us all, that we may evermore be kindly affectioned one to another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whose Son had nowhere to lay his head, grant that those who live alone may not be lonely in their solitude, but that following in his steps, they may find fulfillment in loving you and their neighbors. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, our Father, you see your children growing up in an unsteady and confusing world. Show them that your ways give more life than the ways of the world, and that following you is better than chasing after selfish goals. Help them to take failure, not as a measure of their worth, but as a chance for a new start. Give them strength to hold their faith in you and to keep alive their joy in your creation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>
go forth into the world rejoicing in the light of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.